This week, three sides of the coin, we have a 21-year-old interview I did with Bob Ezrin that probably hasn't been heard in the last 20 years. Which is fantastic, too. So you're going to want to listen track to this. Track by track of Destroyer. He comments on The Elder. He comments on Revenge. He even comments on Psycho Circus. You're going to want to listen to this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Everybody, welcome back to uh, God. We're three sides of the coin again. I can't keep up with all this name changing and rebranding we do week to week. Tommy, are you committed to this show? Can we stick with three sides of the coin, or do we have to go back to two sides? I am today. <laughs> hey Way to commit. <laughs> You got Mike, you got Mark, and you got Tommy, Doctor Who. Um, all right. So um, before we get into, I think this is going to be a fun, interesting show, but there's a few things we want to chat about before we get in, mainly because it pisses off some of our listeners that we just ramble at the beginning. I mean, it's not it's not like they've ever seen like a late night TV show where they have like that opening monologue where they kind of rap, talk and talk and talk and then the guest comes in. Um, so Tommy, before we get into anything here, you know what your job is, right? So you got any comments? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> and I think that they're probably the, the ones I was going to read are directed at Mark because he's the big what? man. I'm eating fucking popcorn here. I don't have time to, this is your turn to shine, Tommy, go. Well, I'm, yeah, but these are directed to you. You'll probably have to say yes or no to this because I don't have I'll, a fucking clue. I'll just nod approvingly. Okay, so Scott Eshelman said, Killers is the ultimate maiden album, but they needed Dickinson to move forward and stand the test of time. Unfortunately, I agree. And when I say unfortunately, I got into maiden during the Diano years. That's still my favorite. I love the first two records and the and the singles the most. So, but I get it. In order to do what they're doing now, they absolutely positively did need Bruce Dickinson to evolve. And I love absolutely everything Bruce Dickinson. But those first two records are still my favorite. But yeah, I agree. Okay. Michael Katsella said, speaking of Girl and Do You Love Me, two bands that opened for Kiss on the Australian Farewell Tour 2001 on the Gold Coast, Ace's last official show with the band, The Screaming Jets and The Kings of the Sun. Kings of the Sun busted into Lick It Up mid-set. Mike Rush, Gene's guitar tech at the time, ran on stage frantically waving his arms around telling them to stop, which of course they did. So I, I wasn't there, so I don't know if, you know what the deal is with that. And then Smoke and Shadow said the first Maiden album is perfect and he loved the episode. Oh, thanks. And I agree. That first album. It's funny because here's a little Kiss tie-in just fan-wise. A lot of Maiden fans love the first record, although the band hates the production. Sound familiar? That's yes. uh, what how Paul Stanley thinks of the first Kiss record. But I tend to agree with Paul um on the first kiss record and and i gotta admit i, I think uh, killers sounds way better than the than the first record meaning the second record of iron maidens I, I i i thought i think the killers record sounds perfect um but with kiss i still think had eddie kramer um done the first kiss record and did it with some production value money behind him I think it would have been a lot more radio friendly. I mean, if the, listen, the guitars just, excuse me, don't have the crunch on the first record and they're not muddy. They're just, everything's too, too clean sounding. So, well, anyway. you, you, you know, I mean, that's sort of a problem with many bands, first albums, you know, it, it's, 
they're they're not necessarily the best production, the best work, because they're basically an unknown band. And what label is going to dump all that money into the best of everything? You got to kind of prove yourself, you know, as a band. Now it's a little different now because technology has advanced so much that, you know, you can get really good sounds. And and I can imagine for somebody like Paul, who's been there through 70s, the 80s, the 90s and 2000s now, you know, he looks back to that first Kiss album and goes, shit, that just sounds like crap, especially after you've done stuff like Destroyer and through the 80s and Psycho Circus and everything else where you've got all the technology in the world. It, it, it makes you wonder sometimes if an, an artist, what would it sound like if an artist went back and re-recorded their debut album with proper technology, proper production? Would it be as good as we think it would be or would it lose everything because it doesn't have that rawness? Hold on. They, if the only, see, here's where it's impossible to do. I'd only say that would be cool if you could time travel back to you know, the fall of 73, <laughs> you know what I mean? When they were, yep. you know, because it, it, look, for as much as I love the re-records that uh, they did on that Japanese release, I can never pronounce it. So I'm not even going to attempt it. Um, that came with the Sonic Boom thing. And don't get me wrong. There's some of them are really cool. I really like the Hotter Than Hell on there. But I mean, you know, you're, you're not going to get that unfortunately no, and it, again there's a there's a, a, another great example for me is the first new york dolls record i i love the songs i just think rundgren was the absolute worst person to produce that it just he doesn't understand them well that was my point i mean he was a big star at the time and everything got star power but he didn't understand what they were trying to do uh, a great record song wise but i just don't think it hit the mark. And I'll say the same thing about the first Aerosmith record. You know, it just, again, like you said, like, like Michael said, they just didn't have a ton of money, but, but here's the caveat. Listen to the guitars on the first Led Zeppelin record. Hey, fuck Jimmy's guitar, you know, just roars, you know, and that was recorded in 69. So anyways, and same thing with the first Sabbath record, you know, um, so, I mean, they could have gotten the tones, they could have gotten it, but, you know, I get it. Um, I get it. And I understand uh, its shortcomings, but also too, the songs are so good. They shine through. I mean, there's, it's, there's, there's a reason they're still playing most of that album in 2021. Oh no, you're hundred percent right. Cause the songs are good. And you know, the, the, to, to, to what you were talking about, Mark, I mean, one of the things like in the kiss re-records, you can't re-record and capture the, hunger the excitement the enthusiasm the energy that whether it's kiss or any band of 19 year olds 20 year olds going into the studio to record what they might think is their only album ever you know they they put their entire blood sweat and tears into that they you know they took their entire lives to basically write all the songs on their first album you can't you can't recreate that 10 years 20 years 50 years later by just going into the studio with great equipment well look a great by the way if there's any iron maiden fans uh, still uh you know well still <laughs> if they haven't hit fast forward yet to get to the dennis Stratton part um maiden in 1988 i believe re-recorded sanctuary with bruce dickinson um very cool but it doesn't have that punky edge that the you know, the first one it did on the first record. Yep. Well, and Jack Douglas said to me once, um, he was telling me, I. Ding. Talking, no, know. Jack Douglas said, uh, could I have some napkins, please? <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, could I have fries with that? Yeah, exactly. That's about it. <laughs> um, he, no, we were, I, I was in the studio with, uh, with the Odd Fathers, Bren's band, and, and he was recording them, and we were talking about Aerosmith. And he said that they they can't record another Toys in the Attic or Draw the Line or Rocks because they just aren't there anymore. You can't yep. recreate that. So I guess my question to you, Michael, is, is when you say recording with the right technology, are you saying take the technology back in time, give them the proper recording? No, no because, I mean, it, it would be like, okay, 
Gene and Paul re-record your your debut album in 2021. Okay, because it, 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 it will never. It might sonically sound great, but it's going to miss that that rawness, that energy, that you know. To your point, Tommy, Gene and Paul are not in the same position they were in in 1974. No one is. No one is. They're not hungry. They're not. They're not excited that they're going into the studio to record their very first album. That, hey, hey, listen, I'm not a musician, but that puts some, that brings out something in the performances when, when, you know, it's a bunch of kids who are just like, we made it, we got our record deal. We're in a studio. We've got a producer. You can't, you can't recreate that no matter what kind of gear you have. I agree, but I can say that I've always felt that they were shortchanged in the recording process when you listen to the finished product and had nothing to do with the band themselves or how they played their instruments. But sonically, when you look at um, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road that came out the same year and how freaking amazing that still sounds to this day or Zeppelin IV, or, I mean, pick a bunch of records. So I think that they were just in a position being a new band on a new label with limited funds. Anyone else in their position would have probably ended up about the same. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Kerner, exactly. and, Kerner and Wise also were a big part of that. Yep. I mean, look how different the sound was from the first to the second. Same, same engineer and producers. They just didn't know how to capture Kiss because, as we all know, it's no secret, Kiss Alive was pretty much redone in the studio mm -hmm. and listen to the guitars. And that's only really less than two years later, you know, listen to the sounds. Well, and it was there. They just didn't have A, the, the people, or B, this also to Kiss was green. Yeah. You know, but but I would say that, like, if you look at New York Dolls, Too Much Too Soon was a massive leap forward sonically mm -hmm. for the New York Dolls over their first record. But I had read an article once with David Johansson. He was saying that he got in a fight with uh, Todd Rundgren at one point when he was recording vocals. And Todd wanted to do, like, I don't know, overdubs or, or I don't know, whatever it was. And he just said, excuse me, sir, are you accusing me of having melody? And I just <laughs> love that because that is the dolls it wasn't hello it's me it you know all of this is is fun to think about and talk about in a bar over a beer it it the reality is it, it would never happen it can't happen you will never end up with a product that the fans would go oh my god that's it you recreated the kiss debut album with all the energy and the excitement using technology in 2021 it would never work out that way it's just a dream people yep that it is um one last comment because mark mentioned it uh christopher rosio said and this is for the maiden geeks in regards to sanctuary although the song is created or excuse me credited to iron maiden according to contributor dave ling the song was originally written by guitarist rob angelo as a member of the band in 1970 seven who was paid 300 pounds for the song's rights from 1998 onwards the song was credited to murray bassist steve harris and singer paul diano that sounds about right on the debut jacket um it just says i credited to iron maiden so yeah. you know again uh i i that's how come i asked uh um, dennis if he was part of that and he said but i'm glad you did because people obviously that was cool Oh, good. And, you know, again, everybody knows if you're a Maiden fan, you know, Steve Harris is Iron Maiden. I mean, in many ways, shapes and forms. So that's how come I just, I was just surprised. You know, I, I always like, I, that's one of the reasons I love doing this show with, with you guys. You're both business guys too, but I love the music business side of things. And I, I got to admit, if I was Dennis Stratton, I would I would be bummed. I mean, there's the, just the opportunities missed to have your your songs published or your songs. You know what I mean? That 
because obviously he kept writing he's writing to this day you know with his own band and um but man just to, to get a to get a writing credit on that first record would have been just incredible you know so but anyways uh you know yeah, but I, you know what as a fan though it probably means more to you than it does to him probably probably you know that's the hard part you can't put you can't walk in his shoes because you're different you know i do so there you go um no more comments no that's it so let's throw out a couple pieces of kiss news here that kind of dropped today that august 3rd we're recording um first of all and i don't have the actual wording or dates in front of me but the kiss south american tour has been moved to next year 2022 um and and that's official kiss kiss made that announcement but also today um, and this isn't officially announced by KISS yet, but a newspaper in Australia um, put out a little article, Rock Legends Move Aussie Shows. Promoters are scrambling to save giant rock tours with U.S. superstars Guns N' Roses and KISS set to reschedule their Australian tour dates. The U.S. supergroups had planned to launch national runs in November. Guns N' Roses in stadiums and KISS in arenas across Australia. On Tuesday, KISS's longtime Australian promoter, Andrew McManus, said he had been forced to act on the tour of the iconic U.S. band. Quote, I'm moving the KISS tour dates. I have to, end quote, he said. Quote, within the current COVID safe guidelines, the government is purporting most shows and tours will move back to 2022. There is no way you can run a tour properly at the moment, end quote. It's believed that KISS dates will be moved to March, and promoters are discussing a 2022 run for Guns N' Roses. Both bands are playing extensive U.S. tours this year. Guns N' Roses Australian tour promoter Paul Dainty said, quote, no decision had been made, had yet been made about the band's 2021 tour down under. So again, not official from KISS, but it sounds like their promoter, which is pretty much as official as it gets, is moving the KISS tour dates to March of next year in Australia. And it's, you know, Mark, Mark and I have talked about this over the last few episodes, especially the ones where we were just filling because Doctor Who wasn't here. But- Who? Ooh, yeah. Um, you know, it's think, things are with. still very interesting <laughs> with tours right now. Even even in the U.S. right now, there's we've talked about the bands that have had to cancel dates, postpone dates. I've I've shared uh, an article with these guys, and I can actually post it on on three sides as well about a crew member that posted on reddit talking about how bad things are basically in the crew world that people are just getting infected now thankfully they're vaccinated and it doesn't sound like they're ending up in the hospital or dying but lots of infections seem to be happening um it's still i don't know what this is going to mean for the kiss tour that starts in what two weeks less than two weeks two weeks uh you know cross your fingers cross your toes hold your breath people this is you know this is uncharted territory for kiss and every band and i I don't personally feel like we will end up back in lockdowns but this might we might end up being in the position of people are going to be forced to show a vaccine to get into a venue. Now let's not even get into that. How's that possible? And people fake the cards and all that. We know all that. I'm just saying as of today, the city of New York announced that they were going to require vaccinations for people to get into events and indoor dining and everything else. So this is, Things are changing really fast. 
in this business and in this industry right now? I'm more, I'm, you know, take all that, just set it aside for a second. Um, I, you know, like I talked about on the last episode, I'm still seeing the KISS crews being heavily promoted, you know, cabins available, cabins available. I, and guys, I have zero inside information on this. I just can't see this thing happening, but it, it right now it is. Right now it is. Um, and I, and I, and I'd, I'd agree with you, Mark. I'm just, if I was a betting man, um, I would say the odds of the Kiss Cruise are happening are less than 50% at this point. I, I'd go, I'd go 40, 60, 40, it happening 60. It's not. That's, and, that's and, a you fair know guess. What? Yeah. You know, and, and like I said, I, I, this, this, I'm <laughs> a matter of fact, before we started the show, Liz and I were talking about it and we're like, you know, if it's canceled, we're still going to go somewhere. Um, you know, and I, look, there's nowhere I'd rather be than on the kiss cruise. I, I, but I just, you know, as looking at things logically, I just don't see it happening. Um, I think there's a go ahead, Tommy. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I I think that it'll start up as intended and they'll get through September and then maybe reevaluate. Because you've already got the ball rolling to the point where I think it's very hard to put the brakes on it again. But I don't know. I don't know enough about touring and pre-touring and and all the setup to 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 say I you know I don't know. I, I have friends on the Kiss crew and they're working right now. They're getting everything ready. Yep. You know. Right. So that's what Tommy is, is is saying. And right now, isn't the isn't the Green Day Stadium tour? Green Day's right happening now? right now. Yep. So the balls are, are rolling, but I don't, and, and you're, you, you know, I, I don't think they're easily stopped, but. But, but then again, don't... but then again, let's look back March of last year. It was pretty easily stopped in the blink of an eye across the board. But, but, but Michael, it was, but in, there was all kinds of things they didn't know. They... Well, no, you're hundred percent right there. And, 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 and as I said, I don't, this is just my personal feeling. I don't think we are going to end up back in a lockdown like we were last year, but I think things are still changing. Uh, you know, the, well, the, these bands and these tours have always cared about the safety of their crew and cared about the safety of the audience. I mean, everything from, you know, pyro and, and all of that, this is all brand new. None of these tours have ever had to contend with something like this before to the point where that Reddit article mentioned like what a chief COVID officer or something like that, that should be going out on these big tours who it's a person on the tour whose sole responsibility is making sure bands and crew and, and fans are kept safe. And that may or may not be happening. Is that guy going to wear a jacket with anchors on it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Jaws reference. For you. Um, I, I, well, I, you know, I just got through two huge festivals, Country Fest in middle of June and Rock Fest in the middle of July. I picked up the crud at Country Fest, no different than you do on the Kiss Cruise. But it was a summer cold. But other than that, that was about it. Now, what ended up happening, I don't know. But I certainly ha have not heard of any massive breakouts in Wisconsin over it. So I, I just, I think it's a 50-50 proposition, depending on the situation. And, and I was listening to the radio today, and they were talking about this, this Delta variant, variant. They said that it is highly contagious, but also considerably less deadly than the original um, 19. So at that point, then it's like, if you're getting people who are infected that have the um, vaccination as well as people who are unvaccinated getting it, I just think that what's gonna end up happening is, is people will, will, will realize, look, this is going to be with us now, just like the flu, and we're gonna to have to manage yep. getting through this. Now, how that looks, I don't know. Well, Tommy, and, and that's, the, that's the whole point. To... They, they don't know how to manage it yet. They're literally learning on the fly as they go out on the road 
and start doing these tours. They're learning that, that night what, by night. Yes, that was what I was going to. I'm glad you brought it up, Tommy, because that was exactly where I was going. Um, yesterday, um, I read a Wall Street Journal article um, about the incidents that's going on on the East Coast, where 75 percent of people in the Massachusetts town. It was some some of was like, I don't know, around eight, nine hundred people total in the study. Seventy five percent of them who got infected were, were already vaccinated. But um, like what you just said, Tommy, the while they did test positive, there were no very few, if any, hospitalizations. No, on, no zero deaths and zero yeah, deaths, like, like but, very little but, hospitalization. Correct. So that's what I was saying. I'm like, well, like exactly what Tommy said. If this is just a management issue, and if it is just, you know, well, maybe a, a cold or, or a flu-like symptom, well, we didn't stop our lives for the last, you know, 50-some years for the flu. Or, and I'm not, I'm not downplaying this at all, oh, but I'm just saying if, if, if that's the case, though, you're right. You just go, you know what? Well, move forward because as, as long as there's zero, because that's always, you know, without getting too political that's always been my whole thing the whole time fatalities what's the bottom line on this so if if you can if you can say it's mitigated down to zero and and again i'm just talking i'm not saying that's what it is but but say moving forward that it is just you get you know flu symptoms well then to me it's game on just you know we, we, Again. we've all gone to work with the flu at some point in our life. Right. yeah <laughs> well and, and the other part of it look at what's happening in canada apparently they are citing people and chasing after them for trying to get into the country with fake vaccine cards yep you know and when kyle had his vaccine he came back with a blank card they gave him one and, and he's like well aren't you supposed to fill this out and they're like oh you can just fill it out and that was a, a legit thing where he went to get his vaccination so it, <sighs> yeah i mean the, it, this all comes down to how do they manage this how you know obviously we've talked about you know they they care about the safety of everybody involved with the show but we've also talked over the last year or so that there's a lot of insurance and financial ramifications that go along with this that they might be able to manage it, but maybe insurance isn't comfortable enough with how it's being managed. Well, did you put that on the ticket, Mike? Could you put that on the ticket? You you waive. Oh, and... you, you, well, yeah. I mean, listen, it's it's been there for as long as I remember. You go to a hockey game, there's a thing on the back that says you might get hit with a puck, and if you do get hit with a puck, you waive your rights. The problem, you... as we've always said, is that doesn't stop anybody in, in in the United States to find a lawyer who's going to sue anyway and tie it up in court and settle out of court and uh, you know it it is it is what it is right or wrong you're right Mark the disclaimers are on the back of every concert ticket baseball ticket you can get hit by a fly ball you could get hit by a, a baseball bat um, who knows I mean I guess all I'm I'm saying to everybody is you know, let's just pay attention. I mean, things are changing so very quickly Daily. right now. And there's a lot that's not being, you know, that article in Reddit that I, that I read kind of indicates there's a lot that's happening that isn't being communicated. Could very well be. To. And why, who knows? It's, I don't know if people are intentionally downplaying it or not. Doesn't matter. It's just, they don't know what they're doing. Well, yeah, and I mentioned earlier First Avenue, which is a club here in Minneapolis, they have issued an, uh, a directive now that if you want to come to one of their shows, you have to show proof of vaccination. So I wouldn't be too surprised when we're talking about the management piece of this, like you said, Michael, since we don't know, there's a very good possibility that's one of the ways they're going to try to manage it, hoping that if you're vaccinated, it may cut your risk a little bit. Um, so we'll see. I, I, and, and I think if anybody's been paying attention to the news, at least here in the U.S. over the last week, it seems like more and more businesses are starting. I mean, like, what did I just read today? Like Tyson Foods is requiring all 120,000 of their employees to be vaccinated by November. I mean, yeah. it, it, that's becoming common. 
And, but what it doesn't address is how do you do that? Because as we all know right now, there's no, I mean, you can, you could, you could print out a blank vaccine card right now and fill it out and pretend you're vaccinated. Uh, you know, there was, I think we've talked about him in the past. There's a, a music industry commentator, Bob Lefsitz, who's got, you know, he's, he's, he's very controversial, but he's got a lot of great insights. And he did an interview with Irving Azoff, I don't know, a month ago, and he flat out asked Irving, so what's going to change in the concert industry? I mean, Irving Azoff, if you don't know, I mean, he's just mega, mega manager, promoter, label, everything. I mean, this is the guy that knows it all. And Irving basically said, nothing's going to change. We're not going to require, now again, this was about a month ago, we're not going to require vaccines because here's the problem. As a country, we dropped the ball on that. People are getting vaccinated, but we did nothing to to put a system in place to prove you're vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a uh, 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 a central deposit database that's accurate. You know, whatever you might want to say, because right now it's all just you're trusting that person at the door. Yeah, because when you got vaccinated, vaccinated, what they should have done is a QR code or a barcode on your um, tag or whatever, your, your ticket. Then when you go to, to a show, if they were hooked up to the database, all they'd have to do is click your ticket just like they do, scan it, and then scan your vaccination thing, and it'll come up. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, and again, there's there's a whole lot of issues with that. But that's the part that, I was going to say, let's get off this subject. Yeah, there, we're not even going to go down that road of issues. The point is, there is nothing in place for verifying a vaccine. No guy at a door taking your ticket can go, yes, Tommy Summer says he is, and this proves he is. You are right. literally just trusting the word of the person walking in to say, yes, I am. And here's a card. Where did that card come from? Could have come from the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, so. I, I know, in, I know. In California, they've already busted a couple people at bars who were selling blank cards. <laughs> America, capitalism. <laughs> Gotta love it. Finest. So, I mean, yeah. Let's get back to this. You know, South America kiss dates got moved. Australian dates look like they're going to be moved. What does this mean for the U.S. states? Hold your breath, people. Cross your fingers. Let's hope nothing happens. But just pay attention to especially what's going on in other industries and, and other bands. That's going to be a good indicator of what could happen with a KISS tour. Um, all right. So before we get to this week's topic... Uh, we got somebody um, joining us real quick for like 10 minutes here to um, plug an upcoming two night Kiss tribute show in Mark's Detroit Rock City. Matter of fact, he did borrow my old router too, or router. If, yeah, uh, yeah. He, he, he was literally <laughs> calling us from the ice rink to promote this. <laughs> That's a true story. True story. <laughs> sit, ended up sitting in the locker room, I think. Um, so sit here, check this out. And uh, as soon as this little plug for a tribute, upcoming tribute show is over, we'll be back for this week's primary topic. Hey, Three Sides fans. I uh, want to welcome to the show my friend Tommy Morris, who's uh, in the middle of a hockey game, but uh, came here because he's got a big <laughs> show to promote. Uh, which is going to be on Friday, August 13th, and Saturday, August 14th. Tommy, uh, what you got? Thanks, fellas. Uh, big fan of the show, and thanks for having me on. And, uh, you know, they don't call it Detroit Rock City for nothing here. So, uh, of course, as you mentioned, Friday, which is a great day, right? Friday, August 13th, Saturday, August 14th. We have a uh, tribute band from Florida that has been on the Hard Rock uh, Cafe U.S. tour. They are a Disney-promoted band, and uh, they are going to be up here uh, in Detroit on those days to put on their uh, Pyro Circus tour show for both those nights here downtown with the backdrop of Detroit in the background with the great music, the 
pyro going off, the theatrics, the stage show, a whole ton of people and some great video footage at, uh, right from the heart of downtown Detroit on those days. Awesome. And, and what's, what's the band's name? It's a Kiss Alive tribute band. Okay. And they're based out of Florida. And uh, they've, been around, they've been around for a while and have got some praises uh, from the original members of KISS. And of course, they've tuned in and seen them before around this circuit. And uh, that's why we're excited then to bring them here to Detroit. Uh, the, the call originated uh, from a friend of mine, Upfront Entertainment, that is a Disney uh, entertainment uh, promoter, and said, hey, listen, before they, uh, after the pandemic here, before they go on the residency with the Hard Rock Cafes, uh, are you uh, are you interested in possibly bringing them up to Detroit? Um, I said, heck yeah. I mean, listen, we've got, uh, you, you know, the Kiss Army here in, in Michigan. So, uh, you know, let's bring them up and put on a show and let's do it right and, you know, have everybody warm up for the, uh, for uh, the original KISS lineup, September 1st, the DTE. Yeah, I, I tell you, what, one of the cool things about this show is the location. It's right next to Little Caesars Arena, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump from Comerica Park, uh, two places KISS has played. Um, it's going to be outside, um, yeah. which is uh, really exciting as well and uh, on saturday um tommy was nice enough to ask me to throw a band together so absolutely you get to see me, you get to see, you get to see me sing and play on saturday so so you can come um, out and meet mark chicchini <laughs> in in the, in well, the yeah. person in the flesh here is here is man well, you know, we, we don't want to see all the flesh <laughs> it depends how warm it is out there if i wear my tank top you're gonna see all the flesh so <laughs> just not the blue speedo yeah no speedos mark uh, well, no but, but but seriously this is going to be a great night two nights of uh, of rock and roll these guys have an incredible stage show oh, oh these guys have an incredible stage show again it's going to be outside uh, mark can I don't you, you keep breaking up there. So I guess it's the it's the KISS routers that we have here in Michigan. Um anyways, uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. And uh again, it's gonna be at Henry's uh Henry's Club, which is literally Harry? right next to or Harry's, excuse me. Harry's not Henry's, Harry's Club. Sorry, Harry's Club, which is right behind um Little Caesars Arena. Um, lots of parking, um, fun place, uh, right in the heart of, uh, the entertainment district in Detroit. Um, so, uh, looking forward to that, uh, matter of fact, this is going to air on the 13th, no, the 10th, excuse me, this will air on the 10th and then the 13th is Friday. So when you guys hear this, uh, get your friends together and then a couple nights later, we'll all go down and rock and roll all night in Detroit rock city. So fantastic. Love, love to hear that love to hear that it's going to be you know off off the chains there's two video crews of course detroit city tv is going to be broadcasting live uh both shows also and they're going to be on rotation uh we're expecting you know, drones the theatrics and, and right again as you mentioned right in the heart of of downtown right in front of little caesar's arena there and another bonus is that the tigers are in town playing the cleveland indians so downtown is going to be absolutely rocking around that place and you know, for what better show to have a rock down there than, uh, you know, to have a, a kiss, uh, a kiss tribute. Uh, okay. So this week, again, no guest, but we did a little, we had at least a little planning. We gave ourselves 24 hours to plan this one out <laughs> as opposed to 24 seconds, which we did. Exactly. Sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, we did that in, we did that episode uh, a few weeks ago where we had the old Sean Delaney interview, that we played for you and then we came back and um, discussed it at the end. We're going to do the same thing today, but I dug up an old interview I did with Bob Ezrin from, I want to say about 21 years ago. I was, I was still working for, for KISS, running KISS Online, and this was somewhere right around the farewell tour either it had just been announced or I, it was in the year 2000 and um 
you know, I don't think I'd been even with Kiss for two years yet. And I was like, hey, I'd love to interview Bob Ezrin. Is that okay, Gene and Paul? And they said, sure. But then I said, how do I get hold of them? I don't know them. And they said, um, McGee's office would connect me with Bob. And uh, sure enough, I reached out. Bob was more than happy to do an interview with me. Um, I don't think I flew to LA for just this interview, but I was in LA for some other KISS event, I think. And I went over to, and again, this is 21 years ago, but I think it was the KNAC.com recording studios at the time. And I don't know if Bob was involved with KNAC.com at the time or just working out of their office or something, but this was a face-to-face -face interview I did with um, Bob Ezrin from 21 years ago. It was at that point posted live on Kiss Online, but sadly, we've and we've talked about this a few times over the over the few episodes. Um, when I left Kiss Online and they launched a new site, they basically destroyed all the content that had been up there for. I don't know, five, six, seven years that I had put up there. And this was one of the interviews that was up there that um, was gone. Now, I had fortunately saved my audio files from it. So I don't know if this interview has been posted anywhere else or heard anywhere else than 21 years ago on Kiss Online, but let it roll. Here's about a one hour interview with Bob Ezrin keep in mind from 21 years ago, talking about everything he's done with Kiss, all the albums, and especially a track by track of Destroyer. So let it roll and we'll see you at the end. In, in the roster of all the different bands that you've produced, where does Kiss fit? How do you stack Kiss up and the albums you've done with Kiss? Well, I'm, compared to there's no question that I'm closer to these guys than I am to anybody else in, in my life, uh, in my career life. Um, and uh, so they stack up in a whole other way, you know, because again, I say to you, you know, they're not, these are not guys I work with. These are people I consider to be my brothers. So. Um, I feel closeness to them is just it's unique. I'm fortunate to have a certain closeness to a number of the people that I've worked with in the past. I'm still friends with Lou Reed after all these years, and Lou, you know, he still calls me Bobby, and we, we still talk, and there's a deep affection there. But I don't see him as much as I see the guys, the, the Kiss guys, and um, and he and I are not. You know, there's a lot of of ways in which we're very different people. We don't connect quite the way I connect with these guys. I'm still very close to Peter Gabriel. Peter and I have stayed in touch all these years and, and are, are true friends. I mean, we meet and talk about our kids and, you know, we're honest with each other about how we're feeling about our careers and what's going on and what's happening in, in our lives and stuff. Um, and I still am in touch with and continue to work with Alice. Who Did you work on his newest album? Yeah, I'm executive producing it. So um, that'll be exciting to hear. Yeah, it's going to be. It's it's quite a new. And Eric Singer was on that. Yeah, he did a great job. How paths come across each other again? Well, you know, it's not by accident. Um, we all we share a lot of things, all of us, you know, and it's nice when we can bring all that together in a studio and we can work together. I introduced Alice to Bob Marlette, who I think is an amazingly talented guy, and and uh, Alice brought Eric with him. I. I think Alice got Eric right after Kiss, and so I mean it's just like mm -hmm. you know, paths crossing and uh, uh, connections. Anyway, so I'm really close to a lot of those people. Uh, I'm still friends with Dave Gilmore. I talk to Gilmore from time to time, and and uh, just about life and family and stuff like that. But I don't have that closeness with anyone else that I have with with Paul and Gene both. So where do they stack up? I mean, they're, I don't see them as part of that roster. Uh, they're part of my family. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, like I said, I'm, I'm going to grow old being close to these guys. If, if someone said, give me the, the, your three albums that you've produced, 
that say Bob Ezrin would Kiss be in there? Oh yeah, no question. What would what what would the other ones be? Um, the Wall. Uh, it would be uh, Destroyer, The Wall, and um, one of Billion Dollar Babies, Schools Out, or or Killer. Not sure. In that order, Kiss would be the number one that you would destroy. Or would be the one that you would show first and say, "This is me." Even more than the wall. Mm, I don't know more because they're different, I, I, and I wouldn't put any of them first. I wouldn't say, "Okay, this is one." Here's that, three. But that's a pretty good. If you take those three things and you look at them, you go, "That's a pretty good cross-sectional look at what it is that Ezra does." Yeah, and then. Most everything else I did is if re is referential to that, uh, to one of those in one way or another. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to expand it to four if you'd allow me, Mr. Berlin. Sure. Uh, Berlin, okay, the Lou Reed album, which which really was the sort of testing ground for many of those things that I then picked up and used with Kiss and and with other people. Um, now here's the album that many Kiss fans might say. You did to try and kill Kiss. <laughs> yeah, well, that was an intentional. <laughs> I, th I think I, th I didn't do that record. That was another guy. Paul, Paul described it, I think, somewhere as a great album, but not a great Kiss album. No, a terrible Kiss album. You know, and that's funny because again, Stanley and I were in this little. We were in this dinky little eight track, not even an eight track, in. Um, I can't remember what the town was, some small town in Ontario, north of, you know, Richmond Hill or something like that, north of Toronto. Um, and we went in there and we started writing and we played everything. I played the drums and he played the guitar and we did all this stuff and we came up with, um, I am just a boy. And it was so emotional and big and stirring and melodramatic and we should have been shot dead right there. <laughs> <laughs> we should have been killed right there before we went any further. But then we started, we got this concept. I got this concept. I'm sorry, you know, I was in the concept, you know, and I, I you know, I, and, and by then, you know, everybody had been, um, everybody had been touting all of my so-called concept work. You know, I'd done all these concept records. It really weren't in a story sense concepts, they were just, they were built around an idea mm -hmm. that I wanted to put forward or a vision that I had for where I thought a band would go or a sense that I thought that a show should have or something like that. Not, not really a beginning to end story concept. This was one where it was really a story. And of course, um, I caught these guys at a fairly vulnerable point in their career. Um, where they were searching for something and they needed a breakthrough. They wanted to get out of the makeup. Um, and, you know, Gene was toying with movies and um, Paul always had aspirations to something higher than rock and so on. And just, I guess we all just sort of started drinking our own bath water, unfortunately. Now, they uh, get together with you for this with an intention of doing an album that was going to top Destroyer. Well, you know, we didn't sit down and go, oh God, we have to do Destroyer. We sat down and said, you know, the band wants to make a change and they want to do something important and they want to do something different. Um, although they didn't start off on honestly wanting to do like a project like this. They right. had no concept. I talked them into it. I take full responsibility. <laughs> I talked me into it, but then of course it wasn't like I was talking to um, a reluctant audience here. You know, they jumped right in with both feet. I mean, Gene loved the idea of writing a story, and and actually to this day I think the story of the Elder is a great one. Not you don't really get it off the album, but we have a script that Gene and I wrote for this concept called the Elder, which I thought and still do think is you know a really cool sort of weird science fiction kind of movie. Mm -hmm. Would have been a better movie then it was a record. Much better. And then we had all these other guys coming in and people who were friends of the band and you know that it just it was at a time when the band was in upheaval. Uh, it was certainly not at one of the better periods of my life. I was like uh, you know I was out of my mind and, and at that stage um, 
you know, both personally and artistically sort of at sea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we were really trying hard. And, and, and you can hear it. <laughs> we, were tr we were like over trying. And uh, I, we just didn't have the material. You know, even though we did, we made a couple of valiant attempts, and there's, you know, one or two ideas in there that are worthwhile looking at, but for the most part, uh, it was really just a contrived album. Do you think this album pretty much put the nail in the coffin for Ace leaving the band? Um, I'm, I think the experience disheartened Ace, uh, you know, and, and uh, um, probably, I don't know, nail in the coffin, he's back. Right, well, it's so, back then. Uh, my understanding was he really was fighting to do a rock kiss record and the concept didn't so yeah, well with it, him at all. Yeah, Ace was not into this. He thought this was, was bullshit and he was right. He was totally right. But, but you know, just in the same way that it was, wasn't a really great time for me personally, it wasn't a very good time for him either and people weren't taking him very seriously. Yeah, I think that upset him too. And just, you know, in the same way that I said to you, there was this magical confluence of, of creativity and, and, um, and talent and all that stuff on the making of the of Destroyer. There was an absolute absence of that sort of confluence on the Elder. Everything was work. Everything was hard. Everything was like... Um, it was a job. Was it, it, well, yeah, we didn't, I mean, I never took it as a job, but it was really hard. It was hard. And um, and I just I didn't do a very good job. Bottom line, you know. And then when you played this for the band and the record company, I bet you really got some reactions. Well, the band no, the band actually liked it. You know, we actually talked ourselves into liking it. It was the the and the the band was lucky they weren't with me when I took it in for the playback. I was like, oh my god. It was like the end of Act 1, Scene 1 for yeah, of Springtime for Hitler. And the producers, you know, they pad the audience and everybody's sitting there with their mouths agape. Like, you know, oh, it was unbelievable. People were trying to be polite, but they were, um, they were just, they just couldn't believe that this was actually a Kiss album. And I don't blame them. But they, the, um, the power of KISS and the most amazing thing about this band is that they could transcend this and a whole bunch of other crap. Right, it didn't kill them. I mean actually the Elder is what is credited for bringing them back with Creatures of the Night exactly. where they got their heads straight again. Exactly. It was something that they had to go through. So, may so maybe you actually saved the band. Hey, listen, I'd rather, just, <laughs> I'd rather just forget about that whole thing. Uh, you know, I don't want to take credit for it either way, thank you. <laughs> Revenge is a great album. I mean, many fans will say it's an album that could have easily been a great reunion album. It sounds so much like yeah. this ever sounded. Yeah, the sad thing about Revenge in its own way is that, um, um, is that it wasn't a, 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 a kit, you know, a, an original kiss in, in makeup record, you know, because if it had been, I think that with the material that was on there, um, it, it probably would have been like one of their biggest records. But that having been said, Revenge couldn't be Revenge without without having uh, Bruce, Bruce and, and Eric involved because they brought so much to it. So it could, could never have been uh, one of those, you know, we, it couldn't have been a reunion right. album. It wouldn't have had the same character. So it was kind of in between. Too bad because musically and spirit, spirit wise, and just class wise. I mean, some of some of Bruce's guitar playing on that record is just awesome. I mean, seriously awesome. When we play some of the stuff over here, they, I, you know, I don't pick the playlist. They pick the playlist. And when they play, they stick a track from Revenge on in the middle of anything. Doesn't matter what. It so stands up. Playing energy, songwriting, sound-wise, just on every level, and and Kulik comes off like you know a guitar god, and Eric played amazing drums and so on and so on. It you know there was they made a great contribution, and the record overall is a very good record. But uh, we all know that this is a business. This is show business. It's it's not. It's truly not virtuoso business or a music business. It's really show business, and and the show part. Uh, didn't stand up because it wasn't the kiss that people really wanted. The kiss people really want, obviously, 
as we see now, is that original kiss. They want those guys in the big boots mm -hmm. with the with the paint on their faces. Now, what what brought you back into the picture at the at the stage of revenge? Um, they did. Gene and Paul approached me because uh, they needed to make the story again <laughs> get us back to that. <laughs> no, not really. But they wanted to make a great rock album, and Gene, it really was Gene, who said, I believe Ezra can do it, uh, even in spite of the Elder, right? Paul was very angry with me for the Elder. He really was. And very angry with me for, um, in a way, letting the side down by allowing something like that to happen. <laughs> and, and also, you know, he was concerned about, about my drug problem and wanted to know that I, that I was sober and, and that I could be counted on to do a good job, and I don't blame him. And uh, so Gene brought me and Paul back together, which I'm really glad he did, because um, I have a fondness for Paul Stanley that I don't have for a whole lot of people in this world. In fact, I have for both of them. You know, they're like, um, these are not guys I work with. These are my brothers. Mm -hmm. And they're, it, it's true. And there are two guys f with whom I will be connected for the rest of my life. We're going to be three old Jewish guys sitting on a porch somewhere, gumming our, our you know, boiled chicken, talking about the days when we made sweet pain. <laughs> so, so Gene brought us back together, and Paul and I had it out, and um, um, and he was very direct about it, and very. Um, uh, very honest with me, and I was very honest with him back, and you know, told him what had happened to me over the years. It had been quite a while since those days, and um, my life had settled down enormously. And uh, um, and I felt um, ex I, mean, I was excited by the opportunity to be able to sort of make good <laughs> for, for that you know that bad period during uh, the making of the elder. And um, so we decided to give it a try. That was the first thing. We said, let's try. Let's see how it feels and stuff. Well, we, st we tried for 15 minutes and we knew, you know, that this was going to be fun to do and really it felt like going home mm -hmm. for all of us. We got into the, re into the rehearsal hall and it was like right back to the old days. They wanted me to bring the whistle back, you know. I used to wear a whistle on Destroyer. <laughs> I'd blow a whistle and yell, campers, <laughs> <laughs> listen, here we go. Right. And um, uh, we wrote together, and we came up with some great stuff. And I think that uh, you know, it, I, I'm almost sorry that we couldn't have taken revenge and then done one more, kind of, because I feel like what all revenge was was kind of getting everybody back into the floor right. and getting that it was really just getting started. Uh, of course, the thing with Eric was. Um, uh, you know, a terrible blow to everyone and happened while we were doing the record. Right. Um, and uh, uh, he had actually come in during the making of it. He was very ill and he was not capable of playing. He just wasn't. Um, so he sang uh, backing vocals. On, and, and we were just kind of finding our legs again and we were really getting into it as the album was wrapping up, I think. And it um, would have been great if we could have continued and done one more. Did this feel like it was approaching, like with Destroyer, you said it was like a moment. It was, you know, it, it was, there was some energy in the studio, which wasn't there during The Elder. Was that coming back yeah. during Revenge? Yeah, oh, definitely. That, it, it was, was definitely it was coming back. Right. Yeah, it was definitely coming back during Revenge. You know, it wasn't the original band. It was a different band. It was Kiss and that it was Paul and Gene. But it wasn't Kiss, the Kiss that I knew that we made Destroyer with. Right, so but, it, but it was but Kiss we, getting back to but Kiss it, roots. It was so to Kiss speak. getting back to Kiss roots in a way, and 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 again, I I really mean this with the greatest of respect for for um, the other guys because I think that you know what what they brought what what Singer and, and Kulik brought to the picture on this record was a kind of intelligence and musicality and power and stuff that, you know, we probably couldn't have achieved with the, the two original players at that time. Nonetheless, as good as it was, it would have been, um, I wish that I could have jumped straight from that into an original group project because I felt like 
um, Stanley. The and momentum was. Yeah, Stanley and Gene and, and I were, you know, we were on a roll and we were really starting to get it. And it's, it, we actually, in fact, did try to do that. It was my problem with, with other... That's what I was going to say. That leads us into Psycho Circus, where you had some early involvement. I, we had we some fully intended to do it, and uh, we started working together on it. It was very fragmented. I had this company that I was running that it was just kind of... It, that took over my life, and uh, it was a prior responsibility that I had, and there was no way I could get out of it. And that really killed me, because I wanted to do KISS so badly. I so badly wanted to do it. And we were getting to the point where I kept having to put them back and put them back because it was like, no, it'll be um, August, no, now we can start November. And then I just finally got to the point where I turned to um, both the guys and to Doc and said, I can't do this to you anymore. I, I don't know when I get out of this hell. And, uh, and I don't want to screw up your lives and I think you got to carry on. And Doc has, you know, had the relationship uh, with Bruce God rest his soul, mm -hmm. um, for many years and, and you know, approached Bruce and, you know, Bruce took the job. And I think, you know, Bruce was laboring a little bit under the pressure of having to sort of live up to what the expectation was, you know, of what I would have right. done under those circumstances or something like that. But he quickly got over that and, and you know, took over and did a Bruce album. Um, I wasn't there, so I don't really know how that went and, and how they felt about it. I think the record's pretty good. Yeah, I'm as a fan, I like it. It, yeah. it rates up there very high with me. Yeah, it, it has, you know, it it it's not Destroyer. Actually, to me, it's an album that seems to capture Kiss through the '70s, '80s, and '90s. Right. It wasn't setting out to just recreate 1976 over again. Right. Well, I don't think you can do that. Um, but it does have, it's got a lot of elements that are modern and, and it does it does tie the band up to the to the present day. I, I was going to ask you, I mean, as their producer, three albums and knowing Kiss, what what do you think? I mean, what is your just take on the songs that are on Psycho Circus? Do you think this is a good reunion record? I mean, what, what yeah, I doing? think it's a good reunion record. I think that it's a, an unfair question to ask of the guy who just told you that he wished he could have done it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, you know, I can't be objective about it. I, you know, the, the only thing that I regret is that I didn't get to do this record. I mean, obvi you know, I, I obviously am going to think that I would have done a much, much better <laughs> job. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't know if I would have done a better job or not, but I do know that I would have really loved doing it. And that having done Revenge and having had that sort of momentum going, um, that doing a Psycho Circus or something like that would have been great for me. I would really, really would have loved it. And so, kind of regretful that I wasn't able to. But, as you know, the boys and I are still buddies and we're still doing stuff. You know? Anything is possible and anything, with this. Anything is possible with them and, and most anything does happen. You know? yeah. Over give it time yeah. and it will happen. We finished Destroyer, and I delivered the album. Uh, we went through an awful lot of stuff to get that album done, as a matter of fact. We finished the album and uh, delivered it, mastered it and delivered it, and uh, we went through an awful lot getting this record done because, of course, there were some elements here that, that Kiss had never played with before, um, including orchestras and uh, some very complex arrangements and sound effects and all kinds of strange stuff. So um, the process of making the album wasn't exactly business as usual for the band. And then when we finished the album and we delivered the album and we played it for some people, I think there was real concern within the organization. Organizations in Kiss's organization, <laughs> the, the record label? In the everybody. Kiss organization, and I don't think the record label as much, although I hadn't heard from them, but I certainly did. I heard from the... Um, I heard in the resounding silence from Bill Klein <laughs> that there might be some concern for the uh, the quality of the end product, you know. And but and well, I mean, it seems a little shocking that they would have concern at the end because 
they were in the process through the whole thing, so wouldn't they pick up on this? The process was so exciting, and there, and there was so much going on all at once. It had that kind of energy that you see in these internet companies. Right. <laughs> just um, a thousand things happening all at once, and, and we were all caught up in it, and it was just so um, energizing to be a part of it that I think that they didn't have a perspective on the record until the record was finished. And when the record was finished, I think they got scared. I think they got scared because it was you know, sort of orchestral and weird, and um, it was um, a departure from anything that they had ever done before. And uh, after delivering the album, I went away on vacation and was gone in Europe with my kids for, I don't know, I was there for three weeks, four weeks or something like that. When I got back home, there were uh, 20 messages on my service from Jack Douglas who had worked for me, right, who was a producer who had worked for me and, um, and had produced um, Aerosmith mm -hmm. for and with me. And these were messages from Jack Douglas and he was like freaked out. I had to call him right away. So I called him, you know, what's up, dude, what's happening? And he said, oh man, I, I, I don't know what to do about this, but um, a coin called me and, and was like wondering if I would do, if I'd work with Kiss. Because he said they were just so utterly disappointed with what you had done. Well, this, this actually shed some light then, because in the Aerosmith biography, it mentions literally in passing how Jack Douglas was approached by Kiss to produce them. Right. And like, I can't remember the exact year that it said in there, if it even said a year, but I, I'd never heard that before. Right. Well, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. So I said to Jack, and I, it was like, and, and I just come back from vacation after delivering what I thought was just an awesome record. You know, I thought this thing was just going to blow people's minds. I thought this was going to be the uh, breakthrough album for Kiss. It would take them from being a kind of, you know, 15 to 18 year old boy band and break them on a worldwide basis, you know, and, and, um, and so when I get back and there's that message, you know, that Jack Douglas, my protege, has been approached <laughs> to take over the production on this band because they were disappointed. I was like totally freaked out. And I called Bill Coin and I was furious. I was absolutely, first of all, furious that, that nobody called me to tell me right. beforehand that I have to hear this from Jack, you know, and, and be put in that sort of a position. Um, I'm not sure that Coin had even discussed it with the group yet. Um, and and he you know he was very apologetic and oh you know sorry I didn't you know we were just exploring and blah 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 but um, but he had to confide in me that the truth was he was extremely concerned about the record very concerned so that that was the framework you know that was the sort of um, the atmosphere into which Destroyer the Kiss disaster was released. <laughs> now, the, the, the whole different direction and the orchestra and all that, was that all your influence that you brought into it? Or did they also kind of say, well, we want to try and do something a little different? Well, they didn't come, you know, they didn't um, approach me with um, the mandate that I was supposed to do all this really weird stuff to them. <laughs> you know, I think that the idea was we met. Um, I can't even remember um, who initiated the uh, the discussion about production. We actually met on a stairwell at City TV in Toronto. We really did. I was I'm, I was I was going to do this TV show, and they had just finished doing it. And these guys were coming down the stairs as we were walking up the stairs, and they were like 90 feet tall, and I'm just this little short guy. You know, and I come I'm going up the stairs, and these monsters came down at me. And the interesting thing was that. I had a fan in Toronto, a young boy who uh, got my phone number. Uh, I was listed. You know, just looked my name up in the phone book and called me and was like my fan, you know, all the Alice Cooper stuff mm -hmm. and everything. And he called me one day and had said to me, There's this band called Kiss. He said that you should be producing because these guys are awesome. These guys are the best band ever, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not, you know, but the records aren't as good as they are live, right? And you should just be doing this band. So I'd heard about them and I had listened to their stuff and I was aware of Kiss and everything. Then I ran into them in the stairwell at uh, City TV and I don't know who said what to whom. Somehow that translated into us getting together to talk about producing uh, a, a project together. And I went to see them playing in Michigan 
in an arena where 9,000 people got up on their feet and stayed on their feet through the whole show for a band who had never sold many records, not really. And, um, and I watched the show and I watched what they did and I came away with a vision um, that I put forward to the band saying basically what they reminded me of at this point was, um, you know, they were, they were almost too ugly for prime time a little bit. But that there was a part of them that I could see, you know, I saw the potential on stage for there to be a part of them that was a little sexier, a little more um, girl friendly, you know, a little more universal, a little more. A little more polished? No, they were pretty polished. They were always polished. They knew exactly what they were doing. There was. Um, I mean, of course, as, you know, as time goes on, people get better at their craft. Mm -hmm. But, but for their this, their stage and their history, they were very polished. They were the most polished band I'd ever seen at that stage. And um, but we, we, what we talked about was that with a little bit of a different approach to the songs themselves, we could create uh, a relationship between this band and their audience that was much more emotional and much more. Um, uh, sort of broadly appealing that would really bring in everybody outside of the 15 and 18 year olds without alienating those guys right so we could keep the edge and we could keep the drama and we keep the the sort of the high melodrama part of it but but we could also you know get some real sex into this thing and get some uh, uh, and a little bit of cl uh, more class a little more class so I sold that concept and I think that they bought it and they really liked it and they were excited by the idea Gene and Paul have both always been visionaries and they've, they've been able to and by that I mean they've been able to visualize things for themselves before they happen so I think they got what I was talking about and were really into participating and and we really began to build that record um, in our heads, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it happened in my living room in New York, and then and in Gene's closet where he had his studio, you know, and in Paul's little studio in his apartment and stuff. Where we were starting to build up stuff as we were building the material. I think the orchestra fascinated them, the idea of it. Uh, I don't think they really realized the implications of it until they actually heard it, and of course we turned it into an event. Mm -hmm. We had that whole. Um, I think we called it the uh, Grand Kiss Orchestral and Choral Session or something like that, and we invited the press, and we had all the orchestra in tuxedo t-shirts, and we had the kids in the in the choir all in their dashikis, mm -hmm. and we had uh, the band in full makeup and full, and full costume, and I and I was and all my guys were in white tie, and it was <laughs> really it was very it was very funny and um, and very exciting at the same time because we were. It, we weren't just staging something, we were really recording it. Right. Um, so, anyway, uh, long winded answer to your question. They were part of that, they were part of the decision making process, they enjoyed the whole thing, but I think when the album finally got delivered to them, they got scared that it was, uh, that they'd lost their edge a little bit. And then, of course, they had their first like major hit single off of that record and and which really changed uh, the relationship of Kiss to the audience and made them in a sense a pop phenomenon mm -hmm. even more than rock I mean they just became you know these megastars and um, uh, and luckily for us the the uh, uh, Kiss Alive had been pretty successful and, and rock and roll all night had become a kind of a, a party anthem and and rock you know a rock a true rock anthem so the credibility was there the foundation was there if we had really started off from scratch we might have had a problem with destroyer i think destroyer was supported by kiss alive but then it took that thing that kiss alive did and put it from the narrow focus of the original kiss audience to the whole world and they became this worldwide phenomenon very quickly why do you think Destroyer has become their great album that everyone is like, boy, if they could only record an album as good as Destroyer again. But, you know, I, every band has that one album that they just, they always strive to beat it, but they're never going to beat it. Right. Why did Destroyer turn into that and hold up now over time when it well, had think, such a rocky start? I think in reality, well, it wasn't a rocky start. 
Mike. It wasn't a rocky start in the sense that um, during the making of it, nobody was going, oh boy, we're in trouble. I mean, during the making of it, we thought we were brilliant. We thought every single one of these things was just brilliant. It was That's why I was so amazed when I got back and had all those messages from Jack, poor Jack Douglas, who, you know, it was really, and poor Jack, you know, it was, like he was a loyal guy, and 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 he felt awful. He's, he's put into a bind. He's put into a terrible position, and he said to me, "You know, what do you want me to say? I mean, I'll tell him that I'll tell him to forget it. If you want me to tell him, to forget. I said, hey, you know, relax. I'm going to call somebody. We'll see what happens. Um, but uh, not a rocky start. What makes Destroyer the great album that Destroyer is is the amount of time and attention that we spent. Um, on the material itself and the fact that we were all at the top of our game. We really were at the very top of our game at a particular time. We all lived in the same town. The energy around us was amazing. Um, we just seemed to be on the same wavelength, you know, and it was one of those just magical um, collaborations of, of talented people, you know, that every once in a while something like that happens where you have just this magical confluence of of energy and talent, and it produces this, you know, unpredictably good work. Because mm -hmm. um, we did try to do it again a couple of times, and you know, once was a dismal failure, and once we did a pretty good job. But um, there was in both of those cases a kind of forced nature to the project. We were like the forced to go in, and we we want to outdo destroyer. Well, we need to. You know, we're, okay. we're being expected to because right. it's us, right? It's us. We're, we're back together, and we're being expected to make. So we really have to have, you know, big production and you know lots of effects and all this other stuff. And we really, and I think as opposed to the way that destroyer happened, which was not starting off as having to have these elements, but starting off as having to be different and having to have these different kinds of songs. The songs dictated all the production stuff. Um, so, I don't know, does that answer your yeah. question? Do you, do you think they have it in them to maybe record something as good, if not better, than Destroyer? Do you think because times have changed and they have changed and the world has changed that it may not? P specifically, I talked to Peter end of December, and Peter felt very heartfelt that he thinks the four of them still have a great album, even better than Destroyer in them. Although his take was the four of them have to be thrown in a room alone, and the four of them have to do it on their own. Write it on their own, record it on their own, it has to be the four of them. In fairness, um the four of them, the four of them spent a lot of time together during the making of Destroyer, but uh, the four of them could not have made it on their own. There's, there's just no way they could have done it because there was, there is an inherent uh, political and emotional reality to a band. Whenever it doesn't matter who the band mm -hmm. is, whenever you get four people living and working and struggling together. And there's uh, always a need for somebody to come in to be a sort of mediator, uh, motivator, director, you know. Uh, and and I think if they'd been left up to their own devices at the beginning of that, uh, the way that I saw them at the beginning of the project of Destroyer, that, you know, Beth never would have been on the album. They, they needed somebody to push for that sort of stuff. and um, So... I don't think that they could make their great project by themselves. Could they make uh, it with you? I, you know, I don't know that I can do it. I, I don't. You know, I know that at that time I was, I was just in the, I was in the pocket, mm -hmm. you know, totally in the pocket. I was writing a lot and feeling good about it, and um, very much in tune with uh, the both the medium and also the you know, the music itself, and um, we were contemporaries, and we, we were sort of, we were very much in sync in terms of taste, and, and uh, we were good editors of each other, and it just sort of all worked out really well. I think we'd, uh, empirically speaking, do we have the talent to be able to do it? Sure. I think so. I think we have the talent to be able to do something. Um, but life has 
has moved on and the reality of our lives is such that uh, we could never recreate the conditions necessary to do another destroyer. And, and, and if you still... Well, Peter's, Peter's right about one thing. You'd have to push the band together again and they'd have to really live in each other's pockets right. and stuff. But given the reality of their lives now, you know, they're married, they've got kids, they're doing all this other stuff. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Right. I mean, they, they, they are just different people now than they were in 76. They are different people. They no, true different type of hunger, different types exactly. of desires, different exactly. excitements that you can't, you can't recreate that and you especially can't force it to be recreated. Correct. You can't contrive it. Well, Detroit Rock City is like, uh, I think it's quintessential KISS because it, it, it includes everything that they do well all under one roof, you know, um, from the um, from the sort of cocky attitude to the storytelling to the, you know, really balls out playing to the double guitar leads to the, um, you know, to Peter's sort of frenetic little, you know, drum fills, his, his best drum fill, da 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 and, uh, you know, that's his best drum fill, <laughs> and uh, the one that he'll always be noted for, you know, to, you know, p the best place for Paul's voice, the best combination of Paul and Gene, and uh, just overall, if I had to pick one piece of material, forgetting that I had anything to do with it, that sort of sums up Kiss for me, um, the drama of it and the power of it and the sort of just rock sensibility of it it's Detroit Rock City. Who wrote the script for that intro part, the news piece? I did, but that was, um, I sort of sprung that on him as a surprise a little bit, you know, that I just had this idea that I wanted to to get this, um, because I had, I'll tell you what started it, I bought a toy, I bought a binaural microphone, which is something that that here is 360 degrees and that if you were you record something in a binaural microphone and then you play it back through headphones you're supposed to be hearing true 360 degree sound so I started playing with that as an idea and um, decided well I'm going to do this you know real life intro and I'm going to create this story that has real 360 degree um, audio elements to it so that it's kind of like a little eyelid movie you know you put it on you can really see exactly what's going on so I started off with the woman in her kitchen doing the dishes that's me I'm doing the dishes she's listening to the radio where they talk about the accident that's me I'm the radio announcer <laughs> you're, you're the announcer oh, yeah. I thought somewhere I'd read that Gene was the person no I did the announcer okay. and then um, and then the kid goes out to the car, you know, with the keys in his pocket and the stuff. And I was wearing the mic through all of this because I bought this toy. So I'm wearing the mic in my ears and it, it sits in your ears and here's the way you do. So then we did the car thing. And the interesting thing about the car thing was that because it was a microphone and we didn't have radio mics then and, and stuff, and it was attached by a wire to the studio, the car couldn't move, right? So the car is actually stationary when I'm in the car. And I walked out on, this is on 44th Street, uh, right up front of the record plant, the place where John Lennon was just before he got shot. And, um, walked out the front door and there was a, uh, one of our assistants had a car with a manual shift because I wanted to be able to, you know, since the mm -hmm. car couldn't move, I wanted the sound of at least gears, right? right. So we, we had his car in front and I, I had the keys and we turned this thing on and we put a, we sent a feed out to the car. We had a very small, um, uh, transmitter at the record plant, a little illegal transmitter that they kept at the record plant where they would let people um, transmit their records out to their cars so they could check them on the, st on the car stereo right. right when they had just finished a mix or something. So we transmitted out rock and roll all night and um, and I got in the car and turned on the radio and it goes, ah, I'm rock and, and I'm humming along with the microphones in my ear, so I had to be careful. Don't sing too loud, right? And, you know, start the car up and, and make like we're driving away. And that, I thought, when, when the whole piece got put together, when we cut it all together and I laid it on the front of then and then and then and then and then, and I was just, I was so proud of that. To me, it was just, it was a perfect little bit of audio storytelling. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It fit perfect. Yeah, it, it worked great. Perfect. It worked great. Just one of those things, you know. So I, now, we did a few other things that we tried that did not work perfect, you know. Such as? Um, oh, I can't remember exactly what they were, but I mean, there was, you know, a number of different intros and things that were tried for songs that were not great. And then there were the, these ones that were happy accidents, like the little monsters in front mm -hmm. of, you know. 
um, the the little monster noises were my two boys with um, again I bought a toy I was in Paris and I bought these headphones uh, not headphones I mean uh, walkie talkies for the kids that um, one of them was a space helmet that had a walkie talkie in it and the other one was this handheld right and the sound in the space helmet when the when you talk through the handheld was so weird I loved it so much that I put a microphone in there and I gave the other walkie-talkie to the boys and said, make monster noises. And that's what they were doing. They're going, ar, 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 ar. and there's a point at which you hear little Josh, who was like three at the time, two or three, go, I don't know about monsters, you know. And you could actually hear that in there, right? So uh, it was just a, another happy accident because I went shopping. King of the nighttime world. What do you remember about it? The well, seven eight section <laughs> <laughs> and anything what you know what what comes in what pops into your mind when you hear it or just someone says king of the nighttime world what is the memory that flashes back well it's the set the seven eight section more than anything the um, the section in the middle where we go from seven to eight da 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 Da, 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 da. Getting uh, the band to count in seven was really that was a unique experience, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was just no way that that Peter could count seven and play. It was impossible. He just couldn't do it. He was, you know, he's a four four drummer, and that was it. You know, <laughs> you don't give me any of that seven shit. So we made his part real simple. Just you just play one, two, three, four, five, five. Ba, ba, and the rest of us will do seven. We're like, <laughs> two, da, 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 da. and I said, and I'll tell you when to turn it around. <laughs> and that, but uh, in rehearsals, it was a pig because it was like a train wreck. It was unbelievable that nobody ever came in at the right time or any of that stuff. We worked it out, though. We worked it out. God of Thunder. Um, I mean, we all know that that was a rid that was that was written by Paul yeah it was originally a Paul song and, and um, it took a little bit of um, convincing to get Paul to to let Gene be the one to sing it I, are there demos of Paul actually singing it possibly I don't remember you know we were doing our demos were so down and dirty I mean literally like a handheld cassette mm -hmm. machine and we were just you know one of us would play a guitar and, he'd, and we'd sing and one of us would go boom, da, boom, boom, da, you know or Gene's demos were always cool because Gene always had stuff like drum drops which was this record filled with drum patterns on mm -hmm. it right and he would just put drum drops like he just kept he make a loop out of them and stick them on a tape and then play to it you know he was the first guy I knew to do that so, but uh, but Stanley and me, I mean, when we were doing demos, they were like really down and dirty. Um, so I don't remember, but I I do remember that uh, it just struck me, given the subject matter and uh, and the balance of the album by that time, that this would be a great Gene moment, just a really great dramatic Gene moment. You know, just suited the monster, it suited who he was, and so. Um, uh, we decided to give him the song, and uh, you know, I think, and and to Stanley's credit, you know, he, it was his song, and he did not have to give that up. And I think at first he fully intended to sing it, but I think after he, you know, thought about it, and and you know, Gene took a whack at it, I think he was really happy. And I, I you know, I think it's one of the highlights of their set when Gene does that. Oh so, yeah. 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 It's so cool. Yeah, I mean, now you couldn't even imagine Paul ever singing no, that song. No. No. Just wouldn't fit. No, it was a different kind of God, right? If Paul sang it, a right. God of Thunder was a different kind of God of Thunder. And if Gene sings it, it's this, you know, larger than life cartoon right. menacing thing, you know. So I think that I think it worked out well for everybody. I'm sure Paul's happy now. Great expectations. Well <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, sounds like we've got a story for this. Uh, well, I mean we you know uh, I think we did. We sort of went over the top on that song just a little bit, you know. And the good news is that um, now you listen to it and you recognize it for the piece of, of humorous theater that it is, you know, because it is very funny. It's a very, very funny song. Um, but at the time, you know, we were when we were writing the song and when when. Um, 
when we were refining lyrics and things like that, we didn't, you know, the um, the approach wasn't as humorous. We were serious. We had this song we wanted to put forward, and we really wanted it to be big and great and all that stuff. But as the arrangement started to grow, it just became such, a, you know, a, almost an in joke, you know. And the uh, the choir was a trip. Putting the choir on that was a total trip, and it's a, that's a moment I don't think Gene will ever forget, and it's certainly one I'll never forget because the. Uh, the uh, Brooklyn Boys Choir was an amazing experience. These are like, you know, 40 or 50 street kids, tough ass little guys in their dashikis, you know, um, and fighting and, you know, scrapping amongst themselves in the choir. Master would come up and go, boys, boys, boys. <laughs> and you go from the top, and, they, and then when they suddenly turn into these little angels with round mouths, we've got great It was like such a trip to see these little tough ass street kids, you know, suddenly turn into these. Choir boys um, singing on a Kiss record, you know. I mean, it's a, it's one thing if they had turned into choir boys to do the Misa Luba or something, you know. But, but what they were doing is, you know, Gene's song about his, you know, his big member and how much he can use it, you know. It's just the whole thing was so surreal. It was really, um, it was a great experience. And every time I hear it, I laugh. <laughs> Flaming Youth. Interesting, you know. I love Flaming Youth, and Gene to this day makes fun of me in the Calliope. It's the one song that so <laughs> many fans go, I wish they would play that live in concert. I think it's because Gene hated that Calliope so much. I fought so hard for that thing. I said, you don't get it, you don't get it, it's really important, it's part of the feeling. And he'd go, he'd walk behind me and go, boop, 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 boop. I really love the song, and I think that I think it's a, a, actually very well very well written, really well performed, and and I think we got it, we captured it in the studio really well too. So I don't have anything else to tell you except that that um, I, I was punished for that song. <laughs> <laughs> that may have been the reason why Bill Coyne called Jack that. Was, I'm not sure. All of a sudden, it's a circus album. It's a circus album. Yeah. Well, look, see what see what happened. Twenty years later. Yeah. Sweet pain. Um, it's a you know it's a great song, but in the whole album, it's, yeah, it's, it's, like, the album, it's, it's like the one song that kind of just it's, it's, it was the one fast forwarded over one unrealized it was the one unrealized work on the record and um, uh, da 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 it was a, the mistake was right there the mistake was in that device that we that we tried to use which is just not basic good rock. We just, you know, it just isn't. And and then we tried to build around that and make a really great song, and we were really gilding a lily in a sense. And uh, I think the song itself could have been a lot better if we had let go of that convention, that da 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 da, -da that thing. But that the song came in with that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the way Gene presented it, and that that was sort of sort of built in and taken for granted. In retrospect, I, I wish that we had not. I wish that we had. Instead of trying to make that work, I just found something that did work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shout it out loud. I mean, for, that for me is the song on this album that um, that most captures the spirit of the time of the making of the record, the true spirit of of having uh, of. You know that existed among the three of us anyway mm -hmm. between between Gene and Paul and me. I, you know I had something to do with both the other guys. Obviously worked very closely with Peter on Beth and and um, very closely with Ace on on a lot of his solo work, in particular Detroit Rock City, which is like a classic solo, I think. And, but the um, the largest amount of work was done with Gene and Paul because they were the principal writers, and most of that was done before we ever got to a studio. Or even a rehearsal hall. Um, and Shout It Out Loud happened in my living room on my piano um, with the three of us sitting together. And it was just one of those afternoons where Paul and I were picking on Gene because he'd done something. He slept with somebody and not gone home to shower after. So there was a kind of a, you know, there was an afterglow in the air, you know. <laughs> and Paul and I were busting his chops and he was sitting on the bench and, you know, and it was just kind of, it was really warm, you know, affectionate, deep friendship mm -hmm. between three guys, you know, and 
we were just having the best goddamn time. And and we started, we came up with this that that line, you know, right there. And it informed the song. There it was. Bam! We knew where we were going. And the thing just took off. It was amazing. It was really amazing. I mean, that song got written so fast that it was not, you know, agonizing for hours and hours and hours over. You know, it took us a while to finish the lyrics and all that stuff, but the general vibe, the feel mm -hmm. of it, we knew exactly what that song was going to sound like within half an hour. It's pretty amazing. So, I, to me, that's a high point of the, of the record. Not, it's not the classic that Detroit Rock City might be and so on, but... Uh, but it does sum up the spirit of that project. It was, it was a moment. Yeah, yeah, a special moment. Beth. I hear you call it. Or Beck. Beck. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, part of the job of the producer is to um, uh, make sure that everyone is happy while creating the best possible product in, in the final analysis. And, Beth had to undergo some severe tweaking and changes before it became the song that it ended up being. I think that it's ended up being um, a, a classic. I mean, people still talk about it. And I get, I still get emails or letters from people who say that that was what they played the first time that they blank, mm -hmm. fill in the blank. <laughs> and so that's, to me, that's major. You know, I love that. And um, I think Peter, uh, he was scared to death of it. It was a very difficult um, uh, performance to, get, to do in the studio. It's not an easy song to sing by any stretch of the imagination, but particularly for a guy who wasn't really a vocalist. Um, and he did a great job, and uh, uh, I think he, he surprised himself, I think when it was over. I, I think he was quite sure that it was just crap and I was going to hate it. And when we comped his vocal and we played it back for him, he was like, wow, you know, I did that? Whoa, man, I'm good, you know. And now it's become his signature, you know, right. it's like his biggest moment. And uh, I got busted by everybody for Beth, everybody. I was going to say, was it a fight to get that on the album? Oh, big time. It was a big time fight to get a song like that anywhere near Kiss. I mean, phew. You know, people just didn't want to oh, know about hard rock bands back then weren't doing. You don't do a ballad. No, you don't do that then. sort of thing. You, you really don't. So, um, but I really felt strongly that the song had merit and that there was radio potential. And um, oh man, people threatened my life after they heard that song. Seriously, like you destroyed the band. Oh, totally ruined the band. You know, they'll never be the same. I'm going to be. I'm going to be the guy who goes down in history as the guy who killed Kiss. <laughs> There's one guy who said in an article, and I think it was Cream Magazine. You know, that on behalf of Kiss fans everywhere, he was going to come to Toronto and punch me in the nose. You know, he's just going to beat the crap out of me. Um, somewhere out there, one friend has a copy of my response. <laughs> <laughs> Do you love me? I love that song, and and I think that tells a classic Kiss story to me. Total, totally, totally. That's Kiss. Yeah, it is. It, you know, I guess you're right. You know, there's a, there's a number of classic things on the record, but I, what I love about Do You Love Me is again how fast it happened. That one really happened quickly. And that's me and Paul, and it just I don't remember which of us initiated it. I think he you know maybe he initiated it, but I do remember being out here on. Uh, in a rental house out here with a piano in the living room, sitting at the piano going, dum, dum, do you love me? And I just knew it. I knew exactly where that song was going and exactly what it needed to feel like. I could picture him on the stage. I had this idea for a, 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 like a sky hook for a guitar, meaning that I had this idea that he could walk to the front of the stage and his guitar would stick to something and he could step back and not have it. Mm -hmm. you know, so you could go, bam, bam, step, step back away from the guitar and get down on his knees and go, do you love me? And this was my vision for this thing, right? And then we never actually carried that off on stage. But um, what Do You Love Me did for me was bring in the female element. I mean, if you didn't have them with Beth, you had them with Do You mm -hmm. Love Me. And it was just undeniable, you know? And it was, it was the 
I think, the song that truly established the sex star part of, of Paul Stanley. That when he sang that song, girls melted. I mean, how could they not? You know, I mean, you like this, you like that, but do you really love me? I mean, do you really care? It's the vulnerability that Kiss never showed before. Mm -hmm. And it was the very thing that we talked about on the first night that we sat together after that show in Michigan that I wanted to put into the band, was that sense of vulnerability and that connection with their female audience. What about bringing back that short outro at the end of the album? Great Expectations? What was, what was the thought behind that? I don't remember. <laughs> I honestly don't remember. It was just being cute, you know. Oh, we're making Sergeant Pepper here, you know. Let's let's have let's tie it up with something, you know. Um, I don't remember. It com it seemed, uh, I, uh, I suppose, um, what it sounds like to me today is that it was, uh, it was necessary to round off the experience if you were listening to the album from top to bottom, and that you really needed something that just sort of closed the book because you felt like you were really on a journey and you were sort of left up in the air uh, just before that. Yeah, it does, because the beginning with the car, is right. like getting in the car to go to the concert, and the outro is five at a concert. Right. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it was sort of bookending, and, um, and there you are. Although the kid who got in the car to go to the concert never made it. Don't forget. Right. So... You know, it was fun for me to revisit that interview because that was that was a that was just a very cool thing for me, you know, to sit down with Bob Ezrin. I mean, uh, let alone what he means to Kiss fans, but Bob Ezrin's a legend as a producer himself. I thought I thought it sounded very fresh. Still, twenty one years later, I found myself at times uh, drifting into the conversation, then he'd say something and I'm like, oh fuck, that's right, it's 21 years ago. Especially when he was talking about his relationship with Paul and Gene and how special it was, because as we know, it got bad a few years ago and now it, it, it looks like it's better again, but he wasn't bullshitting 21 years ago. I mean, those guys were close. Yeah, I mean, that that's what I found really interesting about the whole interview listening back is, it felt like there was a lot of genuine pride and love that Bob has for Kiss, especially Gene and Paul. And I, I also love that he always referred to Paul as Stanley. Stanley, yeah. Stanley. He referred to Gene as Gene, but Paul was Stanley. Yeah, so, I thought that was I thought that was 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 pretty cool to just uh you know I I one thing that I, I did think that was kind of, he was trying to steer it to kiss, but look, you can't compare the wall with destroyer. Um, look, I know this is a kiss podcast and, and all, but the wall is like, it's yes. kind of like, it's yeah, it's kind of like uh, Michael Jackson's thriller <laughs> it, it, or back in black. It, it gets its own. It, it, no, ser seriously. I mean th that you know. And again, I think I got the interview pieced together in order because it was a whole bunch of separate files that I had. Basically, him talking about his overview of him, his history, then the Elder, then Revenge, then a little Psycho Circus, then an overview of Destroyer, and then a track by track. So I think I pieced it together. If it if it didn't flow perfectly, I apologize, but this is all I had. But yeah, right at the beginning where, you know, I was basically like, how does, how does Kiss stand up against everything you've done? And, you know, and he basically said, of all the work he's done, he's done what represents Bob Ezrin was the destroyer, the wall. And then he threw three potential Alice Cooper albums yep. in there. And then he came back and said, can I do one more? And then he threw in Lou Reed's Berlin, but you could also sense that he really did want to come right out and say, well, the wall is the best yeah, thing I've yeah. ever done, but I'm on a kiss podcast for Gene and Paul. So I better, <laughs> play it nice I, is, I, is I the way it felt <laughs> but you know he did fall on the sword though and said you know that that they're just they had the creative element in destroyer and they had the creative element in um 
the elder, but they didn't have the organization or the, well, I don't remember how he worded it, but I mean, you know, he took responsibility for talking him into it and admitted that Paul was very angry with him for quite some time over that whole thing. Oh, no. I mean, his elder comments, I felt, were extremely honest. I mean, you know, it was a terrible Kiss album. He should have been shot dead. I mean, <laughs> you know, he, he says it's all on me. I completely talked them into this. You know, uh, the band was in he an upheaval. He was out of his own mind. I mean, he was, I felt, completely honest about his view on the elder. Michael, but here's, yeah. some, here's, here's, here's really something interesting that I, I don't think he is picked apart enough. Sick within two to six weeks of the elder being put out, they knew. Yeah. It was bad. A couple weeks after Destroyer was released, <laughs> they equally were as mad. Well, that, that you know, and, and we can kind of jump out of order here, but that was also interesting when he was just doing his high-level overview of, of Destroyer. You know, he said there was real concern in the organization. And by organization, he meant KISS, not not the record label so much, but Kiss, and that that there was resounding silence, his own words from Bill Coyne, resounding silence. And and um, you know, I've I had heard this, but you know, if you're if you're a younger Kiss fan, you might not know this. You know, Bill Coyne called Jack Douglas, legendary pr producer Jack Douglas, and asked him basically. You know, he, he was disappointed in what Bob Ezrin had done. And and Jack Douglas was working under Bob Ezrin. Ezrin was mentoring Jack, Jack Douglas. And and Bill Coyne reached out to Jack to see if Jack could come in, basically fix this. I mean, what, what did he say? Thinks the band got scared when it was finished because it was such a departure. Even though they were there all through the recording, when it was all said and done, they got really scared of what it sounded like. And, the, and they should have. I mean, it, you, you almost hear that sort of conversation about Destroyer and the common conversation about the Elder. Destroyer could have easily gone the way the Elder did as well. Yeah. It, but, but the one thing that was different about Destroyer, as we all know, is, is it was a, it, the songs were consistent. The song, yep. Well, let, let's be honest with everybody. There's one song that's that saved their bacon. Beth. Yep. Beth. Yep. Beth pulled a sinking album up. Yep. And it was the song nobody wanted. Mm -hmm. They vehemently fought to keep it off the record. He had to talk them into putting that on. Yep. Let's again. This here is so sugarcoated. Because Destroyer is what it is in 2021, even places like Rolling Stone magazine hold their nose and allow it in their top 500 rock albums of all time. Mm -hmm. They have no choice. It's that popular. Right. However, history, actual real history. Timeline. Well, Timeline, yes. Right after that came out, and it was funny that he mentioned those those letters to the editor in both Circus and Cream, people were pissed. I mean, pissed. And, it, and it, if it wasn't for the airplay that, you know, keep keep in mind, what single? Detroit Rock City, which we all know Beth was the B-side, but didn't do anything. Flaming Youth, another single, didn't do anything. Now, why, while what shouted out loud, I think went to number one or number three in Canada, but really didn't do all that well in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, there was one song that made the top 10 that dragged that album to the top or, you know, what that would have destroyed or end up with top top 20, I believe. I don't think the record itself entered the top 10. Did it? Someone's going to. I don't um, remember. I don't know. Um, but again, I mean, obviously it was very successful, but you know, that album was pretty, 
controversial. Now we've touched on this before. I know Tommy and I had a conversation about this. We had older siblings and uh, you know some of uh, older friends. I the, I was in a band with a guy who was a couple years older than me uh, back in the eighties, and he knew I was a huge Kiss fan. He's like, oh, as soon as the Destroyer came out, I was done. They they ruined my band. There was quite a few rockers that back in the day that yeah that's what they thought and that yeah. was no bullshit yeah There's a lot, i know a lot of people like that it's almost like destroyer what actually happened with destroyers what people like to think happened with dynasty yeah i mean yes the the, the truth is destroyer was one song a b-side away from being the elder not far not yeah. far I mean, honestly, people, you look at the comments that Bob made about both those albums. You look at how the band reacted to both albums. You look at how the fans reacted to both albums. There's a lot of similarities between The Elder and Destroyer, not musically, of course, because, again, it comes down to Destroyer had the songs. <laughs> the Elder didn't. Um, but everything else, they were very very similar until a b-side exploded to the point where you know bob was making the comment everybody comes up to him and says i remember where i was when i did this for the first time and beth was playing so yeah, much, man, so, much. Well, and so then the question would be is what would have happened if a world without heroes took off um it could have been could have turned the elder into a destroyer yeah you, you guys, so much so, put yourself in the coin shoes. Um, you know, also, too, I, we've talked about this on the show, but again, this is a, something that doesn't get enough, I, I think, notoriety. How short the Destroyer tour itself was mm -hmm. and how quickly about face did a coin get them, get Eddie Kramer, have them record a studio album live in a fucking theater. I mean, that's basically kind of sort of what they were going after with rock and roll over. Right. And you don't, you don't have to be an audio engineer to hear how the tones changed. Yep. Holy shit. Night and day. Well, you know, so, so sit here, sit here and go compare what happened with destroyer that led them to change their attitude, realize what they were about and come out with rock and roll over the exact same thing happened with, the elder and creatures of the night. That's it's where I like was going. These, these guys have lived there and done it more than one time. The instincts, Gene and Paul's instincts were just like, I mean, obviously a coin was gone, um, you know, later on, but, you know, that was it. It's like, fuck, we got to get back to what these kids like. Mm -hmm. You know? Hey, I want to change the conversation just a little bit um, now because I thought it was really telling. Michael, a lot of times in the show over the last few years, and I, I love when you point this out, how when you were calling the radio station um, in, in 83, late 83, about, hey, this lick it up. Kiss took off the makeup. It's now they're good. What did Bob say in that interview? Where he's like, kiss, kiss is makeup. You know, kisses, that's that's the kiss that's special. That's the one people want. That, it, when he was talking about the Revenge album. Correct, correct. But now it's like, boy, because his point was, had Revenge had, like, them in makeup on it, it might have been a little bit more special. And I'm like, God, that runs counter. It always depends on where you're at. You know what I mean? Um, yep. Be, Again, again, like with timeline, I never thought of revenge that way. I meaning makeup or anything. Although I will say, and I'm glad I've, I've got I got to live it. I remember the first time I heard Unholy. I'm like, that's a makeup era song, and and I'm the same way with Not for the Innocent off of Lick It Up. To me, that would have fit perfectly on fucking creatures. That's a makeup gene because he's not trying to be the, you know whatever blog in your fireplace gene this is the mm -hmm. fucking rock and this is the god of yep. thunder gene yep and that's what i loved about so you know the revenge's greatness for me is pure music i mean they had the the, the god of thunder type song with the unholy but they also had the 
cheesy Paul Stanley, you know, take it off thing. Well, and, you, know, I, you know, I think his comments about revenge were also really interesting. I mean, yes, he said, you know, could this have been, you know, a great reunion album, but it also revenge couldn't have been as great as it is without Bruce Kulick and Eric Singer. He said that flat he, out. He, yeah. He, he yeah. did. But you know what kind of bummed me out? Like, and, and, and again, this is nothing to do with you personally. I was bummed that in the interview, you guys didn't touch on Vinnie Vincent and the revenge era. I was hoping that he'd go, Hey, this guy came in. I would have loved to have, to have said to him, was there ever any chance of Vinnie soloing on a song or, or you know what I mean? On some of, on maybe one or two of his compositions. Um, well, and, 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 and now that you're bringing all this up, if I remember correctly, the, the or original premise of this interview was literally just going to be me sitting down doing a track by track of Destroyer with, with the producer, something that at least back then I wasn't aware had really been done or done enough. And I think when I got there, I had enough time to throw in a few more things, which is why I did the real quick, all right, what'd you think of The Elder? What'd you think of Revenge? And by the way, we now know you also had started working on Psycho Circus. So that's why I didn't go quite as deep. I mean, if I could have, I would have loved to have done a track by track on every one of his albums that he produced. Because I think the track by track he did on Destroyer, you know, he didn't go into great in-depth discussions, but it was a lot of fun stuff. I mean, it's like, you know, I, you know, the flame, flaming youth, Gene absolutely hated the calliope, hated it. I love that part. Hated the calliope. He'd walk around behind me in the studio making those calliope noise. Gene hated that song. I mean, you know, hearing those little that just that littlest tidbit or when he talked about Shout It Out Loud that he felt this song most captured the spirit of making the record or that Detroit Rock City as a song is the quintessential Kiss song. It yeah. sums up everything that is Kiss in Kiss. one song. Yeah. I mean, those little insights were were great to me, but you know, going back to the revenge discussion, I mean, I thought it was great how he, you know, he said seriously awesome guitar playing by Bruce. I mean, he showed yeah. a lot of love for for Bruce and Eric Singer. Um, you know, Gene, and it's funny because Gene felt like, what did he say? That he felt like Bob Ezrin could do the revenge album, but Paul wasn't sold on it paul was still very angry because of the elder mm -hmm. all these years later very angry about what bob did with the elder and he was very concerned about bob's drug problem and was he clean and was he sober gene believed in him and got paul on board i mean i i think those those little dynamics there are just so interesting to to hear about yeah. I also, too, I, he kept saying that, you know, he brought up Peter wanting to do one final record. And he, Gene and Paul are obviously where the songwriting engine to, were and still are. Um, I still wish that they would have had the original four on psycho circus um but i'll just tell you as a drummer that song psycho circus has a great drum part in it and it's it, it's obvious that peter didn't write it you know what i mean it's there's a lot going on in in that song and if you listen to the way peter played it on like you know the psycho circus farewell tour and, and don't take this the wrong way. He, he did really dumb that down. Um, and I mean that just, you know, figuratively. It, 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 he, he played it okay. But, you know, listen to the way that, you know, Eric Singer plays it now. I mean, it's, it's a very dynamic 
cool drum part. He kind of, Eric built on what Kevin Valentine did. He, he made a great drum part even better, whereas Peter had to really kind of take simplify Kevin Valentine and simplify, simplify it. it. And, and again, just as a, a lover of Kiss bootlegs, it's really obvious when you hear that song, who's playing drums. I mean, well, I, I can't remember which song on the Destroyer album Bob was talking about. He's talking he, about uh, Flaming Youth. Flaming that, Youth, uh, where the, the yeah. seven, eight, seven, eight yes, time. He's yeah, like, basically, yeah. Pete, Peter, Peter can't play that. Peter can't play that. He's a four, four drummer. He just mm -hmm. can't do it. And, and just to what you were talking about, I was the one that had mentioned to Bob that I just interviewed Peter and Peter thought there was still one more great album in kiss, but it had to be all four guys thrown in the room together with nobody else. And like we talked about at the beginning of the show, Bob basically was saying, that's not possible. That would never happen. They're not in the same place they were. It could never work out. That's that's what I was getting at. Um, and, and, and this is no slight at Peter at all. I want you guys to understand that. And, and again, just to reiterate, factual KISS history, Peter has not played fully on a, on a KISS studio record since Love Gun. 19, and I'm talking all the way through the record, not yeah. just one song. That's it. And that's even including his solo record from 78. He didn't play all the drums on that either. So, guys, let's stop bullshitting one another. Was, was Peter awesome up until about 1979? Okay. I, I would say his drumming for some crazy, well, it's not some crazy reason. It, drugs and alcohol, man. They, <laughs> he didn't mm -hmm. handle it well. <laughs> but up until alive too i mean those shows we have again like i said earlier He's a I, monster I, yeah he played some great drums and then something happened and there's a reason that the producer who produced his solo record didn't want him on dynasty well and and and, and, yeah. and you know this is these various comments that bob makes is why i think Kiss needs an outside producer, but bands need an outside producer. That producer needs to be brutally honest and say, that drummer can't play this. You guys can't write Destroyer Part 2. You're not the same people. I mean, you know, Bob was no bullshit. You know, you may not like what I'm going to say to you guys, but here's the reality. Here's the truth. Bob Ezrin took Eric Carr off the elder for I. Yeah. It just is what it is, my friends. It's not that he had a thing against Peter. It... He had a thing. He had a thing for a, a great producer has a thing for a great song and whatever yes. it takes to make that song absolutely phenomenal. You do that. I, and, and, and that's what, you know, I guess that's always what I felt like with Sonic Boom and Monster is it was just missing that last little bit of somebody sitting here going to make this song even better. Paul Stanley can't play guitar on this one. Gene Simmons can't can't do the bass on this one. You know, pull the Paul Stanley writes God of Thunder, but they give it to Gene Simmons. Well, Gene, maybe that song you wrote for Monster was better suited for Paul Stanley. A producer would fight that. That's what I think is so important for a producer with any band is they are going to push so hard to get those songs great. Now, you know, there's a difference between a first time producer trying to do that, who's had no experience and no history and no wins versus Bob Ezrin, who, yeah, he's had a few flops in his career, but as we talked about at the beginning, he's also got Pink Floyd, The Wall, which is literally a quintessential in a league of its own rock yeah. album. I mean, for our young listeners, if you've never listened to Pink Floyd, The Wall, that's your home, one of your homework <laughs> questions for today. Go listen to Pink Floyd, The Wall, uninterrupted, I would sit here and say, put headphones on and turn off the lights and absorb that song or that album. Same with Sgt. Peppers. You will realize it is beyond so many other albums. 
yeah, it's in a league of its own. Um, again, I'm not, I, I, Pink Floyd's one of those bands that I like a lot, but I'm not a, I have a cutoff period. I'm like from, from metal through, through probably, honestly, probably through the wall. Oh, what's the one at, what's the one after the wall? I like that one too. Honestly, you know what? I'm like you, Mark. I don't know. I'm not a huge diehard Pink Floyd fan, but the wall, when that came out, I mean, I remember when I heard that, you know, KQ started playing the new Pink Floyd single. And I was like, fuck, this is good. And I went out and bought it. I wasn't the Pink Floyd nut that I, I don't think I even at that point in time had owned Dark Side of the Moon. So, oh, I, um, you know, I, I tell you what, as far as just musicality, this and, and it's 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 for a good reason. It's always in one of the top greatest guitar solos. The David Gilmore solo on Comfortably Numb is just. Yep. it's it's magic. It's, it's, it, it really is just, it's, it's a true craftsman at the top of his game. It's just an incredible piece of music. And, but, and but it's funny for, I, I still I, like hearing it. I know. was just, you know, so the whole point of this is somebody like Bob Ezrin, when he pulls out his whistle, like, you know, he's, <laughs> Gene, Gene and Paul were like, you're going to bring the whistle back for revenge. And he's like, yeah, I'll bring the whistle back. I mean, he, he doesn't take shit from the artist he works with well go back to one of the one of the records he also you know he included in the alice cooper thing um because it's got a destroyer connection you know he he told glenn buck oh he didn't tell glenn buxton he just kind of wiped him off the fucking record and put wagner and uh and steve hunter in. you know um that's what he did with ace and i thought it was funny because i've always felt that I was so happy to hear him talk about the beginning of Sweet Pinks. I'm like, I never liked yeah, that beginning of that song. I never did either. I was like, you know, you're, it just doesn't fit. Um, and, he, and he's like, boy, if I could go back, I would have, we would have a, either worked on it more and made it better or just taken it off. Because yep. while it is, I guess, kind of, it just doesn't go anywhere. It did, yeah, that that you know, if you if you paid attention when I first brought up Sweet Pain, for me, Sweet Pain is the one song on the Destroyer album when I'm just like, it just doesn't fit for me. I just skip over that song. It just it doesn't flow with the rest of the album. I like I like Peter's drum performance on that song quite a bit, but from what I've read, Bob Ezrin, this is what I'm talking about writing drum parts. Bob Ezrin pretty much put that drum part together for him because none of that, especially the roles and stuff, none of that is naturally done. And, 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 and if, even if you're not a drummer, go listen to the studio album before it dressed to kill compare the drumming pretty much four, four all the way through. There's nothing. And then go listen to destroyer the drum parts radically different at in moments on the record king of the nighttime world um uh flaming youth especially uh that middle part is we paint da, 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 i'm like peter doesn't play shit like that i mean you could tell that he was being like here's what you're gonna play and he was with somebody who was able to get that performance out of yep. him yep Trust me, trust me, at no time, because uh, didn't uh, Bogart produce uh, Dress to Kill? Yeah. At no time did, yeah. did Neil Bogart go in the studio with Peter and go, you have to accent here. You have to. Well, and, and, and again, I love all that. Don't get me wrong. The drum parts on that album are great, just like they're great on, on Destroyer, too. But if you want to pick things apart, which is what we're doing right here with Bob Ezrin, mm -hmm. Bob Ezrin brought that in. Yeah, because if yep. you listen to the next record too, Peter's back to playing like Peter. <laughs> there are some way different drum parts on on Destroyer that make the really make the music a lot whole lot more interesting. To it, it is well, I mean, um, and 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 sonically, if you go back to again what we were sort of talking about at the beginning of the show, of of bands, you know recording their first albums with no budget, no money to do things the right way. Bob Ezrin on Destroyer was the really kind other other than Alive being totally re-recorded. Bob Ezrin is the first studio album Kiss did with a real producer who understand what he was doing. To your point, Mark, he could sit here and go, 
change that little part right there. Change that note. Do this. Do that. I mean, Neil Bogart basically said the reason he decided to produce them was because it was cheap. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's I mean, the sole reason. I mean, that's the sole reason Neil Bogart produced the album was it was cheaper to have Neil produce it than somebody else. So, of course, you're not going to get quality when well, you get a not... real producer. I mean, look at Rock and Roll Over with Eddie Kramer. When Kiss sits down or Michael James Jackson, when Kiss sits down with a real experienced, qualified producer, the songs are just so much better. But you could also argue the producer's role in different situations, too, because there are some people who consider themselves producers that are actually producing the music like you were just saying. And there's other producers who have more of a hands on with the band in general. And it's the engineer who's also stepping in and yep. saying, let's change this. Let's change that. Yep. So in all fairness, that's a perfect example for Neil Bogart. He was neither. Mm hmm. So he just probably stood there literally at the console and said, okay, guys, one, two, three, four, go. Neil Bogart's like, I've produced bubblegum pop bands before. Yeah. And it's, I, I don't have to pay my, well, I'm sure he paid himself something, but he doesn't have to pay himself like he'd pay a Bob Ezrin to come in and produce Kiss. Go back to the timeline. You don't think that he had listened to the Hotter Than Hell and went, what the fuck is this? I, none of this is going to be on the radio. Really, I mean, let's face it. Look, right. We all love the record, blah, blah, blah. We, I get it. But guys, none of that stuff, especially put yourself in the fall of 74. None of that, none of those tones are, are AM friendly. None mm -hmm. of it. Right. None of it. And if you listen to Dress to Kill, it is very, very clean, very bright, um, very poppy. If you've seen, uh, you know, that thing you do, I want something poppy. Mm -hmm. that's that's yeah. exactly yep that's what rock and roll night was and and it did you know it did at least dent the charts um more yeah. so than anything on uh, on hotter than hell and that didn't happen on accident and that's the fascinating thing about digging you know through some of this stuff and i gotta tell you it, it's been nice the last 20 minutes talking about the 1976 era kiss guys the reason that we talk so much more about other eras is because for the most part everything was great for them <laughs> i mean they were they were selling lots of records and you know S selling out arenas i mean <laughs> yeah. they they were literally super kiss at the time yeah, yeah it's 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 really there's not a lot to talk about for like inside stuff or you know because there wasn't much drama then because every they were a team the rot hasn't hadn't start started yet Yep. Yep. The, 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 the last little tidbit, which again, I briefly mentioned, and I think, you know, those of us who have been fans for a long time had known about, but maybe our younger fans don't is that Bob Ezrin was slated to do psycho circus. He was, he was their choice to produce psycho circus. And as, as Bob said, he wanted to do it so badly and he started work on it and he intended to do it, but his own business at the time got in the way and he kept delaying, delaying, delaying. And he finally just told Gene and Paul, I can't do it. I mean, nothing against Bruce Fairburn and, and I like Psycho Circus. Man, if, if, if Bob Ezrin had produced it, you wonder. Do you think Peter would have played on it? No. I do. Oh, I do. You think he would have let Peter play? I mean, I would think, again, as a producer, yeah, Bob right. would have said, Peter can't play this. He can't do these. He would have changed the arra arrangements then. I don't know. I think, I, I think he was so caught up in the original four magic. He would have, he would have died trying to recreate that. It would have been interesting to hear because I'm with you, Michael. I, I actually, I love Psycho Circus as long as it's my Psycho Circus. Like I said, the one I have on my iPod is not the one that, because I deleted a couple songs and I add, I, I don't know how you don't put In Your Face and, uh, and It's My Life on there. I don't know how you didn't, 
Oh God, here we go with it's my life again. No, no, no. I I, I purposefully am just skipping by that fast. <laughs> but I just think those songs are so so superior to the Peter song and and that dreaming piece of crap that I can't stand listening to. Um, I I took those right off and I I kept the when when I listen to that record, um, the way I have it, I'm, I I enjoy it start to start to finish. There's again it, that record could have been so much better and i gotta admit you know there are some things i wish i wish they would have let peter and ace play on that i don't know i mean because the songs are there man i i love well i think the songs are there i just think you know it could have come back down to that peter and ace just didn't have the chops at that point in time to do it would or let's put it this way would would have would Bob have replaced them as much as Bruce Fairburn did? Maybe not, but I still no. think there there would have been a good portion of that album that wouldn't have been Ace and Peter. I, I think more so. Um, I think he would have let Ace play more on it. You know, let's face it too. I mean, if everybody, rem- I, I think you were still you were still working with Kiss in '98, correct? I started in '98. I started with them right when psycho circus was released yeah because you i know you remember then the drama of even the tour starting with ace oh yes trust me people there you know the the love and the magic we all thought was there on the reunion tour it wasn't there on the psycho circus tour not in the slightest and 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 i'm not saying this in a derogatory manner but you know He's telling Gene, the truth. Gene and Ace really started physically to also let themselves go on the Psycho Circus tour. I mean, they were getting bigger, bigger than they were just a year ago. There was, you know, the, 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 Mark, as you said earlier, the rot was coming back again. And by the farewell tour, it had completely settled in. I mean, it's funny as a side note, you know, that that kiss group which shall remain nameless um posted some photos from the farewell tour that i took in mountain view california in 2000 and like the attendance was 4000 5000 people at a shed that could hold 20000 and somebody commented is like boy that's was pretty bad attendance for that show and i'm like you got to understand by the end, by July of that farewell tour, this tour was already bombing. I mean, yeah. people, people had already started checking out. Attendance was starting to, you know, we, we've said it before, you know, the farewell tour might've started on a good note, but within a couple months, it was already a, a complete disaster. Falling and, that's apart. Ex- and that's exactly why when everyone's always making this argument about, oh, if Ace is there, it would sell all this, these more tickets that simply. No, not- and that, that, that's what I told this guy. I'm like, it's, it's just funny because here we are, it's the farewell tour. Ace and Peter are at this show and they, they didn't even sell 50% of the tickets. And that wasn't a one-off occurrence on the tour. Right. And anybody who went to a number of, farewell tours from summer to October when it ended in the U S you're going to know attendance was hurting at a lot of shows. Yeah, it's true. But anyway, I mean, it would have been, it would have been interesting to wonder what would have happened to the psycho circus album. If Bob was involved, would you have had the same songs? Would you've had the same arrangements? Mark, would you have had the same players on it? Um, you know, I got nothing against Bruce. And, you know, let me th- quick throw this out. I did an interview with Bruce Fairburn when I was with Kiss Online. I did a track by track discussion with Bruce on the Psycho Circus album. I didn't keep a copy of that interview. And as I said earlier, Kiss Online deleted everything. If anybody listening, saved a copy of that Bruce Fairburn interview I did. I would love to get it so we could re-listen to it and re-comment on it. Because if I recall, it was 
there was some interesting insights that Bruce was giving on that album as well about working with the band, working with Paul. He even basically said Psycho Circus is a loosely created concept album. Concept a- about Kiss meeting their fans and you know, if you listen to the start of the album, it's the start of a show. And you listen to the end of the album, it's kind of like the end of the show. Goodbye. Yeah. That was one of the reasons they tied the solo in um, Psycho Circus to the end or the solo, that musical symphony sort of thing. And uh, what's the journey of a thousand years? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's that. That was the tie in. It, so so um, even even, you know, the producer's own words were it was definitely a a loosely recorded concept album i mean not that, like the that, not like the elder concept not like pink that, floyd no, the wall i swear to god that record i i oh i tell you what i always liked it i like it now more than probably ever i, I like it because it sounds really good i love tommy and just so you know that's that's tommy thayer on a lot of that tommy plays really good on on that record very um, you know, tommy plays very well Yes. Um, thank you. And my son's an English teacher. <laughs> but um, I mean, why he is? He's like, I got to fix my dad. He does. You know, look, I, I got construction speak. That's that's you know, just. I know. I just have to. I have to twist your nuts whenever possible. Hey, hey, we're not supposed to tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's for the hotel guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, I gotta get going, guys. Yeah, we, hold on. We, Liz is making ravioli, so you can come in the basement. Liz is making fucking ravioli. Where would you rather be? Down here with these two knuckleheads, or up with the beautiful Liz? Uh, listen, we, with the we, beautiful we, Liz. We know, we know where you've been, want to be. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this. 21 year old interview with Bob Edron. Maybe Loved it, Mike. Learned yeah. a thing or two. Um, homework. Um, obviously we mentioned something earlier, but what did you learn anything new? What did you learn new from mm-hmm. Bob that you may have never heard before about anything that he talked about? Yeah. How about how about if everybody sends us their track by track of Destroyer, Revenge, or The Elder? Don't do all three, because then when I'm reading these, I, I don't have time. But if you could do if you can do pick a pick a Bob Ezrin kiss record, one of those threes, and let's see your track by tracks. Because I'd like to see that. That'd like be that. fun. Yep. And, and and once again, if anybody out there has got the interview I did with Bruce Fairburn back in, I don't even remember what year I would have done it. It probably would have been early 2008. Nah, probably 98, 99. Okay. Um, I'm surprised you don't have a copy of it. You know, it was a phone interview. So maybe I've got a cassette tape buried somewhere but i'll, I'll I reach don't. out to a couple of my kiss geeky friends who have that kind of stuff yeah there's 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 a there's a few kiss geeks out there that literally downloaded and saved everything that was on kiss online yeah. and, and and they're friends and if you did <laughs> if you did send it our way because it's a good interview i mean there's not there there for obvious reasons there's never been a lot of interviews with bruce fairburn about kiss right yeah Hey, also too, um, going back to the beginning of the show, uh, I'm going to be playing this Saturday night. And before I get, this is not, this is not left for dead. You're not going to hear rock and roll dogs or any of the left for dead stuff. Um, left for dead is, uh, writing right now. And what, what Tommy, the, the guy was putting on this kiss show, he just asked me if I wanted to, um, play. And I just called up some of my rock and roll brothers here and, we literally put a, a set of classic rock, uh, hard rock, classic rock hits together. So we're going to be playing for about 40 minutes. So uh, um, come on out if you're in downtown Detroit at uh, at, at uh, Harry's. I think it's Harry's. Harry's next to uh, to Little Caesars Arena and uh, uh, Two Nights a Kiss. And we're going to be there uh, Saturday night on the 14th. Come on by, say hi, and... Uh, I'll be singing and playing my butt off for you guys. So uh, there you go. That'll be, uh, that'll be in fun. So. Blue Speedo. Yeah, I'm gonna do. My, I'm gonna go full Tommy Lee on it. I'll, uh, I'll just oh, be nice. get, the, get the suspenders. Dude. I was gonna say you got to put the suspenders on too, Mark. If you're doing the Tommy Lee. Yeah. And moon everybody at the end of the show. Oh, oh God. 
<laughs> that just ruined it right there. If the blue speedo wasn't enough, Mark Moon and us. Show, is- him the, show him the brown eye, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh someone, God. Just, someone just threw up uh, in their mouth. Sir, yeah, know. exactly. All right. You guys know what your homework is. Again, I hope you enjoyed the, the interview with uh, Bob Ezrin here. If you are uh, watching us on YouTube, please subscribe, follow us on Spotify, subscribe on iTunes, and uh, we'll see everybody next week. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.